Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Asia Future Summit. I hope you had a good lunch. Um, in this session, we will be looking at US-China cooperation in an age of strategic competition. I'm Yan Ping, the editor of Think China. ThinkChina.sg is an SPH English language e-magazine with a focus on China and supported by the Chinese language newspaper Lianhe Zaobao. But let me introduce the topic. We all know that the US-China relationship is one of the most, if not the most impactful and influential relationship between two countries in the world. While the two countries are very different in terms of governance, ideology, cultural makeup and history, it is in the interest of both countries and for the whole world, including all of us here, to find a way forward together that will allow cooperation, some competition perhaps, and also some degree of maybe even conflict and confrontation without leading to war. So I think that's why we are here today, to find the way forward. Now, let me introduce the panel. With me on stage are Professor Wang Jiangyu. Professor Wang is a professor at the City University of Hong Kong School of Law and the director of the Center for Chinese and Comparative Law. He was also with the Faculty of Law, National University of Singapore for more than a decade, where he served as the director of the Asian Law Institute and was the founding deputy director of the Center for Asian Legal Studies. And we have Professor Orville Xiao, the Arthur Ross Director of the Center on US-China Relations at Asia Society in New York. He's a longtime China observer, author, journalist, and former dean and professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And he remains on UC Berkeley faculty as Professor Emeritus. And next to me, we have Professor Zhu Feng. He's the Dean of the School of International Studies of Nanjing University and the Executive Director at the China Center for Collaborative Studies of the South China Sea. He was formerly Deputy President of the Institute of Strategic and International Studies and a Professor at the School of International Studies at Peking University. Thank you, our panelists, for joining us from all around the world. Well, as many of us would agree, China-US tension has worsened over the years, and each country sees the other as the source of the problem. And each is also looking outside of the other to form cliques and alliances. Some say we are heading towards real and comprehensive decoupling, even when both economies are still very much intertwined. My question is, how did we get to where we are now and what are the chances of cooperation, and where are they? Well, our panel will be sharing their opinion on the topic, and after that, we will move on to the Q&A session. May we start with Professor Orville, please? Thank you. Uh, it's really nice to be here in Singapore uh, and to celebrate uh, your founding leader's 100th birthday. And I think in a certain sense, you can say that um, Singapore represents that the best moment in US-China or China world relations when there still was the promise that countries didn't have to choose sides, which is, of course, still Singapore's challenge. Um, I thought it was really interesting this morning, uh, wonderful sessions. But unless I was mistaken, I did not hear the name of Xi Jinping mentioned once. That surprises me, because I think um, he is a man who has written himself very large uh, uh, and is critical to our understanding of what is happening and what might happen. Um, that said, uh, the question that is really very much on my mind, and uh, I'm very interested to hear my colleagues' uh, re reactions and responses is this, and you alluded to it in a certain sense at your in in introduction. Um, why did engagement end? It was an extraordinary 
period of decades that was initiated, as you all remember, in 1971, 72, when Kissinger and Nixon met with John Lai and Mao Zedong. And they didn't know what they were setting in motion. But they were setting in motion this whole era of engagement. And it, that era really took off uh, when, of course, Deng Xiaoping came back into power in 1978, the very end, 79, and then in the 80s, and initiated his period of reform and opening. And the supposition, I think, that everybody uh, uh, sort of adopted was, we could get together. Things were changing. We wouldn't turn into carbon copies of each other, but we could get along. We had different political systems, okay. We can trade, we can have cultural relations, we can have inter academic interactions, civil society interactions. And that initiated a period which many of you have, have experienced, which was one of the most extraordinary periods of my life, the 1980s. And China sort of did come alive. In fact, a British diplomat wrote a wonderful book about the early 80s, late 70s, it's called Coming Alive. And it was a period of immense hope and immense optimism. I think that, that any of us who lived through it experienced it and shared. And then, of course, came 1989 and the Beijing massacre. And that was an immensely tragic moment. And uh, many of us thought, well, all right, this is the end of that halcyon, very promising period of, of togetherness. But it turned out that it wasn't that simple. Jiang Zemin, who many of us at the time looked at as being somewhat uh, a little clownish, to be frank, when you look back on him, you have to say he was quite an extraordinary leader. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was still around for a while, but and kept things going, and reform didn't completely die. The Americans and China did get back together again in some rudimentary form. And uh, you know, I, I've been on many, many presidential trips and watched different leaders interact. And I have to say, on that trip, that when Clinton went to China in 1998. It was a very extraordinary interaction between these two leaders because you could see through their body language, through their facial expressions, that they enjoyed each other's company. And, uh, and this press conference, I don't know if any of you were there, when we were at the Great Hall of the People and as we were walking into the press conference, it was announced, stunning announcement, that the press conference would be broadcast live over Chinese radio and television all across the country. And there was a freewheeling press question session. We went into the room where Clinton and Jiang Zemin were to hold forth, and it was an extraordinary time. These two men were laughing, they were sort of enjoying interacting with each other in a very sort of uh, 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 friendly and, and uh, um, uh, open way. And uh, that was after 1989. Incredible. And then we forged along thinking history had emotion. Do you remember that moment? I think it, m many of us felt history was heading in a direction of greater openness. China wasn't going to become America, and America wasn't going to become China, but it was OK. And then we uh, ended up with Hu Jintao, who was a kind of an unclear in concept leader. Um, not like Hu Yaobang, who was incredibly open and lively and unpredictable, and then Zhao Ziyang, as you all know what happened to him. Um, and it, it was all right, though. Things forged along, and uh, President Biden went to China. It wasn't the greatest trip the president's ever been on, but said, you know, we don't view China's rise as a threat to the na national interest of America. And then we come to... Xi Jinping. And I don't want to belabor this or get into it in any great detail, but it was at that moment 
that this form of leadership in China began to re-catalyze the whole relationship of what went on within China and what went on between China and the world, between China and Singapore, and particularly between China and the United States. It transformed it. And we might want to talk in some way about what that transformation was about. The question I want to pose to all of you in closing is, how did a system that was working so well for China, so well for the world, so well for Asia, how did it end and why did it end? Whose interest was it, national interest, to see engagement end? And yet, I'm sorry to tell you, you know it, I don't need to hear it from me, but it is irrevocably gone. It's over. It's dead. And we don't have a new system to replace it. And it seems to me that if in all of the years that I've been looking at China since the late 50s, first went in the mid-70s when Mao was still alive, to me, I look at it as an immense tragedy and an inexplicable tragedy brought about for reasons which I think um, you can uh, explain some of it, but not rationally because it isn't in anybody's interest that it end, and yet it did. So I'd just like to leave that question out there because I think it lies at the heart of the matter of what our session is about. All right, all right, thank you, Professor Xiao. Um, next, we can we have Professor Wang Jiangyu to give your opening remarks. We can come back to the discussion mm -hmm. later, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure to be here and to be with two uh, uh, distinguished international relations and foreign policy scholars here. Uh, I, I'm an international lawyer, so uh, uh, it's, it's a bit strange for me to, to be here, but I, I do have a bit of interest in international re relations. And it's also a very, very touching, touching event for me because I, uh, I, I, I lived and worked in Singapore for 17, 16 years, and uh, Lee Kuan Yew was part of my life for the better part of those days. Uh, and uh, uh, every, almost every week, we, uh, we, we, we had his, his image and his voice, and we were inspired by him. And uh, we, uh, so I feel it was a huge shock for me, and uh, I thought we are, we, are, we are losing this man in 2016. That was truly a shocking moment. And uh, I, was, I was actually thinking then, if, if, if Li Kuan Yew was born and grew up in China, he could be one of the top three greatest leaders, <laughs> including the emperors, uh, in, in whole Chinese history. In whole Chinese history, probably among the Tang Zhong, Song Zhou, <laughs> Qin Huang, Han Wu, right? very, very likely. So, uh, the, uh, uh, so, so with the, so th th that's why I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to be here. Uh, uh, and with, 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 with all that, I will now switch to Chinese. Uh, uh, the, I have been, I'm very glad I've been encouraged by the organizer to, to, speak, to speak in Chinese, which I, I feel very comfortable, comfortable to do. Thank uh, you, uh, thank Perception is reality. 其实中美之间这么多,在我个人看来,中美之间的矛盾, 呃，尤其是在过去差不多二十年、不到二十年来，最大的变化呢，是认对彼此的认知的变化，就是这个perception的变化。那我看，我个人也认为这是一个最可怕的一个变化，这是最可怕的一个变化。因为中美历史上是没
呃，如果跟今天的今天的现状比较起来呢，这个那两件事情啊，比较起来几乎是什么都不算的，因为那两件事情所造成的中美之间的这个，呃，这个不好的情感，所谓的 hatred， 并没有持续很长时间。但是现在我个人观察到是一个长期的、持续的，而且就是它是一个所谓的 sustainable， 但是 not in good ways， 你知道吧？它不是不是一件好事情。那在呃，就是。从呃历史事实的角度来回顾的话呢，我想这个变化的起点应该差不多是二零零八年左右了，对吧？二零零八年美国有金融危机之后呢，美国有金融危机之后呢，就是中国的，我们必须承认中，在美国的金融危机，呃，美国度过金融危机的过程中呢，中国确实是提供了相当慷慨的帮助，对吧？比如说，中国向呃大量购买美债。然后呢，中国呢，向这个呃，中国的金融机构向美国金融机构注资，而且还不要投票权，就是说，几乎当时美国所要求的条件呢，中国都答应了，中国都答应了。但是呢，也就在那个时候呢，也就在那个时候呢，呃，一方面呢，就是因为中国成了债主嘛，债主这个态度呢，是必定是有一点。这个 arrogance 一定有一点趾高气扬的，而且中国有一些，比如说官员，呃，官员呃，当时说的一些话呀，比如说你们是过去的老师，但是你们的老师成了学生，你们已经不配做我们的老师了。所以，包括来自最高层的评论了，可以呢让很多美国官员觉得不是不是很舒服。这应该是一个应该是一个起点了。然后呢，在到到二零零五年左右。我想到二零五年左右，我我我个人觉得，就是美国的外交关系协会，呃 ，CFR 发表的那篇报告之后呢，就系统的去攻击中国，在中国引起的反响也很大。这是这应该是认知的一个一个重大的发展了，就是说美国对中国的认知开始变得。就认定中国是一个竞争者，甚至是一个敌人，然后此后再有再有这个呃贸易战了，就是这是一些简单的历史回顾。但是就是我我我想从中国的角度吧，从中国的角度，因为美国的认知呢，刚才呃刚才呢夏伟教授已经已经讲得很清楚了，呃这个我很多观点我是非常非常非常认同和同情的。但是从中国的角度呢，剩下的时间呢，我就迅速讲呃讲两点，就是关于中国对美国的认知。第一个呢是中国对美国的认知呢，我为什么觉得这是让人觉得非常担心的前景呢？是现在在中国已经产生了一种集体意识，就是说中国对呃反美的情绪呢是前所未有的增长。前所未有的反美的情绪，但是我们不能把我们不能把它仅仅批评为说它就是一种民族主义情绪、不健康的情绪。当它日渐成为一种主流情绪的时候呢，是一个必须正视的，因为越来越多的中国人从。从所谓的从朝到野，对吧？不管是决策者，还是知识分子、政府官员，还是一般的普通人民，其实更多的是普通人民，他觉得美国在欺负人。就是美国在欺负人，美国做的事情都是在欺负我们，对吧？都是在欺负我们。美国发动贸易战，对吧？我们呃金融危机的时候给美国提提提供了那么多帮助，他不感恩戴德。然后呢，他对我们发动贸易战，提然后制裁我们的公司，没有任何没有任何底线。那尽管他说了很多好话，像今天今天早上贾经国老师所说的这个 rhetoric， 呢，有时候你就比如说你在说要对话要对话，但是你做的事情从来都是很凶狠的。对吧？做的事情，你做的就是那么多制裁，从来不放松。然后呢，对中国没有任何，呃，行为正具体的行为上的对中国没有美好的、没有这个友好的行为。所以呢，这是很多越来越多的中国人开始对美国产生一种厌恶感，而且是普通人。而且是普通人，这是我自己观察到的，这是前所未有的一个现象。当然，这个和官方的引导是不无关系的，一定是这样子的。但是以前官方也有引导，但是产生不了这么大的效果，对吧？产生不了这么大的效果，就是很多中国人他从这个美国的具体政策上来判断，说美国现在对中国呢是不怀好意的。对吧？是不怀好意，甚至是可以用这个词来来表述的。那么第二个呢，就是。在中国国内呢，是就是关于认知的第二点呢，是在中国国内严重的缺乏对中国自身问题的反思。就是第一方面呢，是我们认为美国很坏；第二个呢，是中国国内并没有一个环境去。促使中国去反映，比如说中国自己出了哪些问题，比如说我们自己有什么问题呢？一一方面呢是在呃在对外，比如说应该说是从呃就是南海问题以来呢，呃南海问题以来呢，就是应该很多周边国家
，还有就是其他国家感感觉到中国在国际上是比较变得，就是比较变得开始，呃，开始去展现影响力。那国力的增强必然带进了它的，必然带动它的影响力的增加。那么这个影响力呢，就很多方面就开始使用，使用起来的之后呢，就比以前的要强硬多了。这是一个，这是一个事实，这是一个事实。虽然我个人认为，作为一个。对外关系的观察者呢，我个人认为是就具体政策而言，比如说中国除了在南海问题上确实比较强硬之外，其他的其实都算不上强硬了，都算不上强硬了。是，但是呢，中国国内认为这是理所当然的，是不需要反思的，不不需要反思的。但是事实上是需要反思的，对吧？因为中，因为别人对你，别人对你的 perception 是什么，你一定是要反思的，那么一定反思的。那么另外一个呢，是确确实实呢是，呃，中国的国内的政策。在过去十年来呢，是大幅度的收紧，大幅度收紧。这种收紧呢，也许有可能是出自呃领导人的深思远呃这个深思熟虑，对吧？他对未来的国家有一个具体的安排，到底是怎么安排？他这个愿景我们不清楚，也有可能是基于他自己的个人经验。对吧？因为他自己的个人经验，可能并不是，并不是说一定是深思熟虑的，但是基于他自己的个人经验，所以就产生了，比如说产生了对意识形态的强调，对吧？对意识形态强调，讲政治，一切都要讲政治，然后呢，对言论的管制，这是毫无疑问的，对吧？对言论的管制，然后还有呢，对对某些特定行业的打击，对吧？零零零的打击，这个可能被人被人家认为是你经济上要开倒车，当然尽尽管领导人本身可能是他，他有一个。长远的规划的，对吧？长远规划的，但是，但是我们不是很清楚的，对吧？那还有一个呢，是比如说，呃，大家所认为的这个国进民退的现象啊，就是这些现象就，就就是强化了，就加上呢，海外对中国的在外交上的这种所谓的比较 assertive 的这个印象，再加上国内的收紧呢，两两两种力量交互作用，所以呢，就造成了海外对中国的这种。呃，现在就越来越越来越孤立中国的这么一个认知，而这是一个正在发生的事实。但是，我想中国国内呢，在对这个问题是没有充分的辩论的，是没有充分的辩论的，没有充分的、没有充分的反思的。所以，我想现在中美的，我就从认知的角度就谈这两点：一个是中国对美国的认知，另外一个呢是中国自己本身对自己的一些行为缺乏反思。好吧，谢谢。嗯、All right, thank you, Prof. Wang. Um, now we can have. Prof. Zhu, to share your opening remarks with us. Thanks. Okay, so uh, thanks for inviting me here. So it's my big pleasure. Um, I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Xiao and uh, Professor Wong's you know, presentation. I want to make some uh, uh, complimentary uh, comments. Uh, first of all, I see uh, deterioration of uh, China-U.S. relations is very structural uh, in terms of international relations theory and uh, historical you know, exploration, the reason is very, very, very basic. So the China become, become what? Become the peer competitor to the United States. So then the US take China as the number one biggest competitor, strategic competitor. You know, Americans policy uh, narrative, because the strategic competitor is very definitely equal to biggest threat, biggest enemy. So then uh, I think that kind of uh, thing is truly happening just because, as I mentioned, historically dramatic you know, the power redistribution between the US and China. Back to in 1979, the China's DBT, GDP was less than you know, 4% of Americans' war. <clears throat> but back to the, uh, in 1999, uh, Dr. Xi also mentioned President uh, Clinton's China visit, and the both leaders just truly not just the shake the hand, also re-energize our relations into the new high. So then uh, Clinton administration agreed to sign sign what WTO uh, you know uh, allowance of the China uh, for entrance. So then Beijing also simultaneously get to the develop developing countries some sort of a special treatment. So then finally, you know, like in 1999, both sides uh, very successfully and eventually finally uh, made the uh, China's WTO entry agreement. It also marked some sort of a historical economic jumping of the China. Since the reform opened up back to 1978, the China's real economic 
you know, the great uh, uh, advancement just started from, from what China's entry into the WTO back to in 1999. The US Western countries opened the market for China's goods, China's productions. But back to the 1999, China's GDP just 10% of Americans won. We're still smaller and weaker. But last year, China's uh, GDP accounts for the 70% of Americans. So now I think there's no, consent, no ag disagreement in the Americans' policy and the strategic cycle. If this century there will be one power, which could just uh, have, say, uh, come up with the U.S. and uh, even overpass the U.S., only possibility is China. So then such a power redistribution, a power re-comparison is truly, truly what? <coughs> truly re-cultivated Americans' China psyche and China's strategy as well. So therefore, then we see U.S. completely change this China policy and a strategy. But I think what is happening almost at the uh, uh, same time is also a very dramatic China factor. So Xi Jinping administration, they are first generation of China leadership out of the baby boomer since the end of the, 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 the Second World War. So that kind of the China leadership really witness the entire China's dramatic change. They consider China did a great job. Not just the brought to China from some sort of a poverty country over to, you know, uh, some sort of a we say Xiao Kang Xie Hui. It's a, a mediately uh, rich society. On the other hand, China also gets, gets the biggest portion of the people out of the poverty. That kind of China's historical contribution. It should just uh, reserve some sort of appraisal and appreciation. But the real uh, contrasting reaction from the U.S. is when the Americans' China strategy changed, U.S. also launched the ideological attack to China. So demonization of the Chinese government and the Chinese internal and external uh, rela relations and behavior also become a central piece of Americans' calling to China you know, approach. Then it also triggered the Beijing's backfire. So then, uh, then we will see China consider, yeah, we should uh, raise up uh, uh, some sort of a new idea on how the international you know, the governance could just proceeding. So Beijing also repeatedly just uh, set out some sort of a China idea from global security initiative to global uh, civilization initiative. So then that's also a reflection some sort of China's deepened frustration at the meantime, some sort of China's you know, new enthusiasm in, in what? In standing up vis-a-vis -vis United States. But second point I have to say, um, no matter how Chinese feel uncomfortable about Americans' dramatic change of China policy and strategy, but there's no way China could just have, say, falling into some sort of, uh, we say, uh, a fracture or even just a, a full, you know, uh, confrontation with the U.S. On the one hand, China is still weak. U.S. is still take a bigger lead in overall, overall what? The national minds. So then Chinese traditional philosophy usually is very interesting. Yeah, we don't prefer to just, uh, how to say, fight with you uh, bigger and the stronger, you know, the, 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 the potential enemy. Otherwise, yeah, we will not just, uh, how to say, have a big chance to win. So then that's why the Beijing remains in low profile. We should get him back to the Chinese traditional philosophy. I mean, we needed to know how to yi luo shen qiang, yi rou ke gang. So from this point, I think yes, no matter how the China's domestic emotions vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. is getting poisonous, 
and even confrontational. But the policy circle was still very, very, very expectably consistent. We refused to let any military security diplomatic showdown with the American counterpart. We should completely reject let any, you know, some sort of a great power seduction of uh, tumbling into, into what? Into some sort of, uh, we say, overall confrontation. So even Taiwan issue, there's a lot of uh, uh, speculation. Probably it could well, all become some sort of uh, explosive points, to be honest. No, I don't think so. Final points. I think, yes, on the one hand, the U.S. just take China as the biggest you know, the strategic competitor. There's no way China can escape from. So therefore, we also have to reconfigurate the China's policy and strategy. So I think Le Jiang Yu also made a point. When a uh, great power just has a uh, get into the re-emergence, it's not the uh, glory, it's a risk at all. So Beijing should be keep the mind sobering enough. Otherwise, that any, we say, unmanageable conflict or confrontation with the U.S. will be very disastrous for the China's historical reemergence. So China's diplomatic pragmatism remains very expected. I think it's also reflecting some sort of a China's leading components of the strategic culture. So I also made two days ago, I think, China will not the Putin as the Russia. China will not Stalin as the Soviet Union. We should recognize how big the risk is when the US being completely about face to China. So most important things Let's get the 1.4 billion Chinese people still have a better off in the coming decades. It's our only most important strategic target. I think the uh, entire Chinese society should reformulate the consensus on. So from this point, I think, <clears throat> yes, on the one hand, from the Chinese government to the Chinese other people, they are anti-Americans. Some sort of a sentiment now is just a really, uh, we say, uh, raising up. But on the other hand, I uh, hope the deterioration of our relationship is uh, some sort of a sobering medicine, and uh, get China pay more attention to to our diplomacy and the domestic economic strategy. So from this point, I really hope in today's words. And when the global issues unbelievably just sweeping through the every corner of the, the, the earth, probably there, all, there is only one choice, U.S. and China competing by way of sticking. On the one hand, we should also in some sort of with a conf conflict, but on the other hand, we should still keep the interdependence almost in all the corners and get the U.S.-China relations moving forward in some sort of competitive but manageable manner. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhu. Well, I think um, our panelists are coming from rather different perspectives. Um, Professor Ovio focuses you know, on the leadership that's under President Xi Jinping. And I think, Professor Wang, you mentioned about US containment efforts on China. And also, there's Chinese lack of reflection on certain of its actions, and also the leadership's tightening of control. Whereas Professor um, Zhu Feng, uh, you have talked about the containment efforts by the West, led by the US, reactions to a rising China. Would you like to respond to what the other panelists have just shared? Uh, yeah. um, you know, there's so many interesting questions here, I hardly know where to begin. <laughs> But let me begin with the question of American containment of China. Let me also remind you that nine American presidential administrations wholeheartedly supported engagement. And I think that it's a really interesting question that we, we, we might 
want to try to analyze a little is the question I began with, why did it end? Because containment came out of the end of engagement. After engagement ended, then people began getting a little bit alarmed, a little bit threatened, a little bit, um, you know, feeling somewhat fearful that, 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 that you mentioned China becoming more assertive. Uh, some people even describe it as belligerent. And I think it was that change which triggered the old impulse within America and now within Europe to some extent too for containment. But it wasn't something that just jumped up out of nowhere. It was something that was a response to China's own actions. At least, that's how I view it. Now, that doesn't mean the United States is a perfect country and doesn't do anything wrong. That's not, 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 not true. But uh, I, I, I think that it's really important to, if we're going to try to find a solution to this, to understand where the impulse to reassert a kind of containment policy comes from. Let me just ask you, too, another question. Was it necessary? for China to completely antagonize Canada, Australia, India, Korea, Japan, and now maybe the Philippines. Why is that in China's interest? They weren't resisting China's rise. They didn't see China as a hostile power. They saw China, they were content to see China rise and to profit by that rise in trade. So I think these things need to be a little more critically analyzed. You can't just say, oh, well, both sides made mistakes. Of course that's true. But you have to look at what's the animating impulse. What began this downward slide that we're all now trying to wrestle with and figure out how to remedy? What should America have done that it didn't do? Sorry, Professor, Maybe, Professor Shell. do you have an answer to that? Well, I, I, I'd much <laughs> rather hear my colleagues answer it because um, my answer is I'm sick of my answers. I know my answers. I want to hear some new answers. <laughs> so speak. First. No, I, I can only respond with, with one question <laughs> uh, to both Professor Shell and Professor Zhu. So the, the, <clears throat> the perceived the radical change in Chinese foreign policy, was it kind of a natural progressing uh, at the, so roughly around the 20, 2012, or was it because leadership change? So leadership change in this regime determines everything. It's also a puzzle to me, it's also a puzzle to me. Right? So, so the, the why, 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 why there was um, such a sudden uh, change uh, in, in both actual in actions and also in international international perception and also very quick response to I, 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 I prefer that it was it was very personal <laughs> because look look at the <clears throat> so the the, uh, the the China Australia debacle right so the uh, the very short trajectory of China Australia relations uh, China uh, the uh, I think I think it was 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 it was about three years ago. So China was very angry with Australia, and uh, the because of the because of the the AUKUS and also because so it, it was when be China beca believed that Australia was and <coughs> was wholeheartedly following the American policy to contain China. So using using a uh, not very well, polite. They, they asked mm. for an uh, investigation of the Wuhan virus. That's mm. what triggered it. Yeah, but the quite interesting. So Australia position hasn't changed. So Australia Australia still has the same position. But <sighs> very recently, China decided to improve its relation for relation with its its relation with with Australia. So so it was also a puzzle to me. So Australia hasn't changed. Uh, the, the, w nobody would see that Australia would withdraw the request, or Australia would not follow the American would withdraw from 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 Akus. But China has seems to have decided to uh, to soothe, right? To to improve relations with with Australia. So it's it's all 
It's all top-down process. It's, I, I don't think you can come up with a rational answer for that. Um, well, that, that may be a truth worth pondering. <laughs> 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 Professor Zhu Feng, you want to respond? This, I think that Dr. Xiao asked a very interesting question. I'll use Chinese to answer. Maybe I'll say the words more clearly to the Chinese people. This is true. How do I say it? 您提到的，比如说中国对韩国、日本、澳大利亚，确实有一系列的这个，我们都知道叫 w a r f w a r r i o r diplomacy。那在很大程度上呢，我觉得确实也反映了，呃，中国今天政府的这样一种 stylish 的 diplomacy， 就是因为，呃，一方面是中国已经是 biggest second biggest economies in the world， 另外一方面呢，我们又觉得你看。你美国不仅呃不尊重中国，对中国今天的崛起反而妖魔化，而且呢还有这么多的你的盟友帮着你一起来打压中国，那中国怎么办呢？中国到底是忍气吞声？中国是咽下苦果？中国是装作低调？那毫无疑问，今天的中国领导人很有个性啊，<笑>所以他也要显示自己的不满和不高兴。但是呢，我个人觉得这并不是中国外交的常态，因为外交的常态还是强调更多的直接的沟通、交流、对话，然后形成新的共识。所以，呃，我个人觉得不能把过去几年的这个战狼外交跟今天和未来的中国外交要完全等同起来。但是呢，我觉得这里恰恰也是今天。中美关系复杂性的一个非常重要的标志，那就是今天的中国已经不会任意被美国打压。你怎么骂中国？你怎么弄中国？我们都装作忍气吞声。这个时代已经结束了，所以从这个角度来讲，中美未来的互动过程，不仅要反映各自的利益，关注。同时，对各自的政策特点，以及背后的领导人的个性、国内政治因素，我们都需要有一个更加深入、平衡、合理的分析。然后，最后一点，刚才呃 d o c t o r 也提到，这个美国今天的中国政策不是遏制政策，今天的美国的中国政策不是美国当年。和苏联冷战时候的遏制政策，这是毫无疑问的，因为美苏冷战他们之间没有任何经济的交集，所以遏制的最重要的措施，在美苏冷战的时代是进行军事的、地缘战略的、全面的封锁对抗。但今天美国是想把新冷战给带给中国，所以新遏制政策代表了美国今天。针对中国的新冷战战略的核心内容，这个内容说到底，首先是科技战，然后是贸易战、数字战、市场战，还有意识形态战。包括现在美国对中国的这个科技战，确实我们觉得完全违背了 WTO 的市场自由、开放、公平竞争的规则。但是，我并不认为说这不是新冷战，不是新的遏制政策。美国今天的对华的科技战，就是新冷战的最具体、最生动的表达形式。Thank you. Thank you, Prof, for your comments. Uh, we can address some of these issues raised in the Q&A session later. Uh, before we open a discussion to the floor, please allow me to ask a question about the Taiwan Strait. Uh, the Taiwan issue is often seen as a dangerous flashpoint in China-U.S. rivalry. Many China observers have also weighed in about a possible war in the Taiwan Strait and the circumstances under which such a confrontation will occur. I want to ask what is your view about this? Do you believe the U.S. military will be directly involved on the battlefield? And what do you think is the best way to avoid this scenario? Do you think the current, stat um, current situation of maintaining the status quo in the Taiwan Strait, if it is actually sustainable? 
Well, you want me to start? Um, oh, yeah, sure. Th this is Professor pretty yes. much at the heart of the matter, I would say, the Taiwan Straits and your field, uh, South China Sea, are critically important. You know, um, when President Nixon was talking with Chairman Mao, and they're trying to figure out what to do about Taiwan, you may recall what Mao said. He said, oh, he said, you know, what does it matter if it takes 100 years to solve Taiwan? Let's not let that get in the way. Then you may recall that when Deng Xiaoping went to the United States to normalize relations with the US, he stopped in Tokyo. And he was asked about Taiwan. He said, oh, he said, let's leave it for smarter generations to come to solve that. Not, not Xi Jinping's version of it's going to be solved sooner rather than later, but let's just not worry about it now. Evolution may take care of it. There is a natural interest that will tie the two together, and we'll deal with it then. Now, what was wrong with that as a solution? Uh, I think the problem is that, um, you know, at one point, Ma Ying-jeou came here, met with Xi Jinping. That was a good move. That was Singapore at its best. And then the saber rattling started across the Taiwan Straits, and it did condition the attitude of the people on Taiwan to make it, and then, Ty, and then Hong Kong got, got, got enveloped by China, and this transformed the political chemistry in Taiwan. You have to acknowledge that. People in Taiwan do not want to be part of the Chinese mainland. So you can't just say, oh, give it to China one of the most august and, and, and confirmed principles of the United Nations Charter is self-determination. So, you know, again, it seemed to me we were on a good trajectory with Taiwan at one point. We were trading, Foxconn was there, hundreds of thousands of employees, Apple was there, it was all okay. It's when it began to be getting to say that we can't wait and that we have the right to militarily occupy and take Taiwan, that just scared everybody in Taiwan away from wanting to be part of the Chinese mainland and made the thing impossible. At least that's my view. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it's an enormous tragedy because we were on the way to mending this thing. And we destroyed that hope. We destroyed that scenario. And I, I, I was recently in Taiwan. I started studying Chinese in Taiwan when I couldn't go to the mainland. I felt like I was back 50 years ago in the world in which I began trying to understand China and asking myself, why? And I haven't heard an answer yet. Do you see a war erupting over the Taiwan Strait? I'm very <laughs> pessimistic because I think leaders with thin skin and men's of the wind, they get painted into corners where they have to act. It's very dangerous. And I fear that that could be, uh, some, that could be what happens with China and, and Xi Jinping. He feels that he's being humiliated. I mean, remember, China is a culture of grievance of humiliation and of anger against hostile foreign forces outside. And it could precipitate some very dangerous uh, actions that could tip the world over in a heartbeat. I fear that. I'm not predicting it. Right. Professor Wong? Uh, but first, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't speculate whether the American military will get involved, but on Taiwan, I, I can make three quick points in Chinese. First, the first is that I have no idea 呃反反分裂法所表达的就是说呃为了保卫台湾或者是收回台湾中国是不惜一切代价这个不惜一切代价 
I take it take it literally， 就是他一定会这样做的，就是因为，因为对某对一个国家来说，总有些东西你是不能放弃的。美国为为什么？加入第一次世界大战和加入第二次世界大战，就是总有一些东西，这个我不认为中国是在在吹牛，就是他一定会不惜一切代价的。如果说他觉得有需要的话，这是第一点。第二点呢，是我个人认为，就是我个人作为一个观察者呢，我个人认为中国其实并没有什么迫切的需要，说马上要收复台湾。呃，不管是和平方式还是军事方式，在未来的可预见的未来，也要收复台湾，应该是没有这个需求的。其实它有一些现实的困境，就是一个最大的困难呢，就是治理问题。就是一旦台湾收回之后呢，一个技术性的问题，收回之后怎么去治理，对吧？你哪里去派？你要治理一个两千三百万人的台湾的，你至少得派出一百万干部去，哪里去派这些人呢？你等于给自己一个巨大的麻烦。这个这样的麻烦是没法。然后台湾台湾人民又喜欢抗议，对吧？人们喜欢上街。台湾人民已经把政府作为一个 servant， 作为服务者当做理所当然。所以呢，如果说你就算我们呃，就算台湾成为呃台湾呃呃就是这个这个统一成功，然后台湾人民天天上街骂中国政府、骂共产党，这也是他不愿意付出的代价。所以呢，其实并没有这样一个 imperative needs 要收复台湾，所以我我我不认为关于传说的二零二七年呀、啊、二零三零年，我觉得因为这些现象不可能发生，这些是不可能发生的。第三呢，是从一个非常的现实主义的角度来讲的话，就是从就是这个这个这个 the most realist 的角度，对吧？非常现实主义的角度来讲的话，因为都说台湾是美国的棋嘛。是美国一盘棋来针对台湾、针对中国的，但是呢，台湾也可能成为中国的棋，也可能成为中国的棋。就是说，我虽然并没有说迫切的收复台湾的需要，但是如果如果就是中国认为自己，因为中国现在对美国呢认，就是朱老师和和我其实有一点，我是我我我我我们是意见是是是一样的，就是说中国政府呢还有很大程度上中国人民都认为美国现在对中国不怀好意，对吧？所以呢，如果有一天，你看你这个限制那个限制，呃，这个这个芯片都不卖了，不仅给给那个、呃、这个这个，然后就就完全的限制，不仅仅是某些企业，所有的都不卖了。如果有一天，他就他其实因为像，呃，夏教授刚才讲的是很对的，中国是一个上百年来饱受痛苦的国家，他对外来的欺负和干涉是很担心的。就是说，这个鸦片战争也发生了，八国联军也发生了。如果过去发生了，未来为什么不可能发生呢？对不对？美国有一天要把我。我们打的要要美国有一天要欺负上门要打我们的话，那台湾也是中国的一张牌，他也可以出手的，对吧？他一旦出手的话，那这个呢就上就会让美国很为难啊、呃。这是当然这是一种极端的猜想了。我就讲这三点，好的，嗯，好的，我我我想在台湾问题上补充两个方面。第一个方面呢，嗯、呃，最重要的是我们要知道，过去从特朗普政府上台到拜登政府，美国的中国政策变了。美国的台湾政策变，这是今天台湾问题为什么变得如此具有挑战和严峻的一个重要的原因。原来美国同同意两岸都属于一个中国，这个中两岸中国的唯一合法政府是中华人民共和国政府。但今天什么是美国今天的台湾政策？你如果要读布林肯、安东尼到拜登总统的台湾政策表述。美国人现在很清楚，什么台湾问题？台湾问题就是美国和西方民主国家要联合起来，共同捍卫两千三百万台湾人民的人权和自由问题。中国能接受吗？台湾问题变成人权自由问题，不再变成中国的领土问题。所以，确实，为什么北京现在这个飞机老在台湾转来转去？这已经变成我们唯一的牌了。我们怎么能够阻止阻止美台勾连，真的不断的造成台湾的分裂的状况？中国现在只有所谓打这个呃军事遏制的牌，但是另外一方面，就今天台湾问题的复杂性，它反映了今天中美在一个战略竞争时代新的特点。所以这点，美国媒体、美国学者说的也很清楚：台湾问题紧张化，台湾关系和大陆关系紧张化，就是美国人要在台海落下的什么 Silicon Curtain。我们都知道，冷战
美苏冷战是 Iron Curtain， 为什么现在是 Silicon Curtain？ 就是我刚才讲的，新冷战的核心特点是科技战，而台湾的台积电，又是今天全球高端芯片和半导体制造的核心的机构，所以台湾今天也成为全球半导体这个呃我们说代工和制造行业的一个非常重要的代表性的高科技基地。所以，两岸关系越紧张，台海越可能走向冲突，那台积电的产能就越来越转向美国。所以，你知道过去两年，台积电在美国投了多少厂？四家工厂，两百八十亿美金。所以，我也非常坦率，台湾问题今天的复杂性已经远远比过去高得多了。所以，中国大陆来说，台湾问题最重要的，我们不能被美国人被美国人什么绑架，把台湾问题变成制裁、打压中国的所谓第二个亚洲乌克兰问题，这完全不符合中国的利益。Might I make a little uh, uh, proposal in the form of a question? Is it conceivable? That at some point a Chinese leader might say, first, Taiwan is ours. Everybody agrees, has agreed to that. Nobody is really disputing that. Second, um, as we develop, as we become more open, hopefully, as we become more comfortable, uh, we will ha have discussions with Taiwan, Taiwan about the proper time and way. To fold Taiwan into the larger Chinese proposition. Now, why isn't that a good way to go? What's the hurry? Uh, here, I think, sadly, is where ideology enters. If China wants to be a one-party Leninist state and it expects Taiwan to accept that in Taiwan, uh, I think it's going to be impossible, and I think we could have war. If China were to say, and this was the virtue of reform, yeah. things are changing. Hmm. You know, and it, at one point we were at that moment where things were changing, and Taiwan was hundreds of thousands of Taiwanese were going to the mainland to work, happy, friendly. Companies were piling in, investment was piling in. Why did that end? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you two. I think Prof. Xiao uh, is suggesting that um, on on Ta on the U.S. side, you would think that you know Taiwan can wait and China can wait, and also Prof. Wang also suggests that actually the Chinese are willing to wait, but now the Chinese are not trusting the U.S. enough or not trusting the whole situation enough. To wait, or you know, so they are showing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I can. I, I, this was already. I, I, I think you are right, Yan Bing. Uh, my, 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 my own view is my own observation is uh, the the. I, I think China has never declared that it will take over Taiwan immediately, or in the foreseeable future. But I, I fully agree with what Professor Professor Jia Qingguo alluded to uh, this morning. It depends on two things. Number one, what Taiwan does, right? <laughs> so the, you have a, a group of people in Taiwan who are so desperate to pursue independence, right? Or in either I in, in the either le, either in the so the uh, legal way or actual independence, de facto de jure or de facto independence, and 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 also it also depends on. To what extent the U.S. treats Taiwan? So the Chinese belief now is the U.S. is using Taiwan as a card against China, right? So you are using Taiwan. So if you, without the the U.S. behind it, Taiwan wouldn't be so uh, assertive, right? In terms of pushing forward for independence. So this is the this is the Chinese reading of the story. It might be misreading, and and uh, uh, but it, but it may be true. And uh, the the American reading of China is China is going to take over Taiwan by 2027. Right? That is also misreading. So you have uh, misreadings here. <laughs> 
All right, so I think yeah. on Taiwan issue, we can just go on and on and on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Is it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we only have 15 minutes left, and we want to invite questions from the floor. So please tell us your name, where you are from, and who you are directing the question to. And uh, try to keep your question short, and also just ask one question. Uh, you can suppose to also you know, ask the question online, but I think we'll just open to the floor. So if you raise your hands, um, and you can direct your question to. Yes, please. Ambassador Chen, yes. Uh, can we have the mic, please? Thanks. I'm not speaking as Ambassador Chen Oville. I'm speaking as a political scientist to a political scientist. And Professor Chia here is a political scientist. And I'm sure, Zhu Feng, you're a political scientist too. On your question, what happened? You know, you were and moving in engagement, and suddenly it changed. Nine presidents of the United States previously pursued a path of engagement. I think China was then a very different China. It was poor, it was backward, it was not a threat to the United States. The United States now is a very different United States also. You've changed a lot to today's United States. At one point, it seems to me that America suddenly woke up and saw that China had gained the military strength, critical military strength mm -hmm. in and political power, technology power, economic power to become your peer, peer mm -hmm. competitor. Mm -hmm. I think I heard there was it, you know, somebody at Asia Society, I thought it was Steve Schwarzman, who thought the year was around 2017. Suddenly you felt it. Mm -hmm. And that was when America, you know, uh, awakened to the fact. It was also during President Trump's administration. Mm. So there was no going back after that. This is a peer competitor and you've got to deal with it. Now, the question I have for you and maybe the other speakers would also, Professor Wang and Professor Zhu would like to comment too is this. In the United States, you said, why can't you get on? Is the United States only able to coexist with a non-communist regime, government? You cannot work with a communist government? Mm -hmm. so that's my question. Mm -hmm. I thought you could. You worked out some coexistence with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So what is it different this time? And I come back to what has happened differently in the United States and what has happened differently in China today. Mm -hmm. You are polarized in the United States. You, people see things in extremes, you know. So is there a nuanced view of China possible? I think America today overdraws China. You know, China has made many mistakes and China is not an angel. For Southeast Asians, you know, we look at the South China Sea and we see problems, all right? So China is not an angel to us. But, you know, nonetheless, many of us think the portrait the U.S. has of China is overdrawn. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is whether China overdraws the image of America now. So, you know, can you find a solution out of that? And the question, can America today live with a communist regime? Well, I'll, I'll give you a quick answer, Hung Chi. I mean, that is at the heart of the matter, isn't it, your question? Uh, I, I would say yes, because we did it for almost three decades. We lived relatively peacefully and tranquilly with a communist regime. I think what transformed the equation of our relations was not China's rise alone, which is unsettling and, and, and obviously causes some people concern, what really threw it off the tracks was the belligerence, the aggressiveness, the sort of challenging attitude, which, I, I mean, many, many countries have now experienced around the world. And I think those combination, those two things were fatal. But China's rise alone, I think we were, I mean, we were, but we were supporting that, repeatedly said, we did not see China's rise 
as a threat to our national well-being. Professor Wang or Jufang, do you want to also respond? Yeah, to first. To 好，谢谢陈大师。我觉得您这个问题非常好。这个其实，呃，我觉得为什么中美关系不好？呃，作为一个中国的这个美国问题专家来，我回美国好多年。我呃前两天这个在我们呃 y o s e p Institute 的那个 ASEAN Dialogue 我也讲过，七八年中国改革开放，到二零一八年中国能经济发展那么好。最重要的、最积极的国际因素是美国。中国人必须承认，所以我相信中国人的这个信仰，我们都知道叫“大丈夫恩怨分明”。我们该感谢美国的要感谢。我八十年代在北大读书，这个对国际关系理论、政治思想，当时是 Professor Scalapino。Professor Tang Zhou， 他们到北大做法文学者。我学国际关系，从这些美国教授身上学到很多东西。但是，我做我我的看法也很简单：大国关系本质就是永无休止的权力竞争关系。所以，美国现在对中国变脸，其实很正常。就是美国就是把自己这个唯一的超级大国地位。作为他要维护的最重要的国家利益，但是美国为什么对中国变脸？还有第二个因素，就是 American exceptionalism。对于今天中国的崛起，主流的美国社会根本没有做好心理准备，他们愿意接受一个崛起的强大的中国，所以美国的中国意识形态从来没有改变。你中国就是个 communist country。所以从这个角度来讲，就是为什么呃，中国政府这几年的对美政策的反应确实也有点起伏波动。根本原因就是中国的领导人，他们这一代领导人也有强烈的内心冲突。我们做的不错，你美国为什么对今天中国这么多年发展对世界的贡献，你根本不能给予？中国人起码的理理解和尊重，所以这个 response 就很强，对不对？所以从这个角度来讲，陈大师，我觉得您的问题非常重要，就是不管怎么样，中美未来的互动必须朝着关系能够可管理的、既竞争又合作的，而且是可以和平共处的方向去发展。所以彼此都需要。真正的意识到，不要 overdraw 这个 image in your own way。所以这一点，我也希望包括美国的政治家，包括这个明年，就是我们也都很担心美国国大总统要选举，总统一选举就是美国的政治季节，政治季节就拼命的把中国问题拿来当什么？当靶子。所以现在刚才江宇也讲到，我们也很担心中国国内的。民族主义的情绪，这个反美情绪，这对两国关系，这些都是我们必须努力去影响、管控的重要的国内因素。谢谢陈大师。You have another, yeah.、Uh, can we have the mic, please? Thank you, Paul Hanley from Carnegie China.、Um, I want to pick up、uh, where Ambassador Chan left the panel this morning. Uh, with John Huntsman and Professor Zha Qingguo,、uh, when she talked about the hope the region has that Xi Jinping and and President Biden can meet at APEC in San Francisco and have、uh, a meeting there, I'm not clear whether that's going to happen or not. If I read the signals coming out of China,、uh, one Ministry of State Security、uh, social media site. Said that、uh, you know they're not satisfied with the U.S. approach, which is containment and engagement, old wine in a new bottle, and that the U.S. side would need to show sincerity in order for President Xi to be able to travel. So, I'd like to try to understand better what that means to show sincerity. What in what form? Orville, the U.S. has 
as many grievances, I suspect, as, as China has in terms of the relationship. Does the U.S. need China to show that it's sincere for the meeting to happen? And if so, in what form? Um, and then if we can make the meeting happen, what would be success from the Chinese side? We have to be realistic, I think. It's not going to change the general trajectory of the intensifying competition and antagonism in the relationship. But we should be able to do some good things. So from the Chinese standpoint, what would a good outcome be? And from a US perspective, what would a good outcome be? You know, Paul, one of my worries about this, I went to the last APEC meeting that was held in America in Seattle with President Clinton, and there were huge demonstrations in the street, even against Jiang Zemin. I worry that if President Xi does come to San Francisco, he will take umbrage at the free expression, which certainly is going to fill the streets of San Francisco. Now, th that aside, uh, do I think it's worth meeting? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I think it's always diplomacy is the only other tool we have. Uh, the question is, what could each, what could Biden and she each give by way of sort of constituting a new form of a relationship? I'm not sure it's very clear. Uh, very quickly, first to, to uh, Professor Chen's question, uh, uh, the, I, 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 as, as a person who grew up in China and uh, studied in, live, and lived in the U.S. for a number of years, uh, you know, it gets frustrated and angry every day because I do have a habit of reading both Chinese and American newspapers. And reading the Chinese newspaper, you see how stupid those uh, nationalist comments and, uh, and reading American newspaper, you see how hypocritical it is. You know, you don't, <laughs> how hypocritical and how biased it is. You, know, you got really, really, every day, very frustrated. <laughs> so the, 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 that, that's very, that's solid evidence that both countries are overdrawing each other, demonizing the, each other. And this is what worries me the most. And, 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 and very quickly, very quickly to, uh, uh, to Hanley, the question, uh, uh, the... Uh, there are, two, there are two explanations. One is personal, that is, after all, it is one man's decision. Because nobody knew why President Xi didn't, didn't go to the G20. Right? There are no explanation. And, uh, and, another, and a number of other occasions, so it is a personal, uh, so, so, so the, it's totally up to one, one person. And when it comes to one person's decision, you can never predict. And the second explanation is uh, what uh, Professor Shell was alluded to. Uh, the, 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 the Chinese perspective, or one Chinese perspective might be, it's meaningless to have meeting between the two leaders because the Chinese understanding is the United States didn't deliver anything, right, after the Bali conference. So nothing has been fulfilled. Why, why will we want to see each other again? Right? So the, you might have reasons to, for domestic political purpose, right, to control the conflict, but we don't have such a need. Right? We don't have such a need, so it makes no sense to meet you. So this is, the, both are my guess. Right? <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> Prof. Chu? Yes,我觉得十一月份这个美国主办APEC峰会期间中美两国领导人在拜登政府上台以后举行第二次 线下的首脑峰会的可能性还是很大的。一方面是我们都知道，六月份布林肯访问北京以后，双方的这个高层对话恢复。但是恢复如何使得这些机制能够进一步的往前推进？那从一九七二年一个松访华以来，其实中美关
，让两国领导人的这个直接对话继续发挥首脑外交的这个引领作用。我觉得是我们可以在中美关系中去重新捡起来的这样一个重要的这个呃政策遗产。那第二个方面呢，就是中美关系，呃，就是现有的这些对话机制怎么往前走，同时又面对各自国内政治的复杂性，中美关系的处理对今天的美国和今天的中国有一点都是一样的，不仅是一个最严峻的外交安全政策问题，更是今天一个最严峻、最危险的国内政治问题，就是。双方的情绪性的因素都很大，所以首脑外交，我觉得其实它在中美关系中，我们应该让它继续发挥这种啊协调、呃动员和向一个合理的方向推进的呃这种不可替代的这个作用。所以我对十一月份这个中美两国领导人举行第二次线下峰会，确实。Yeah, because due to time constraints, we are actually at the end of our Q and A session. Even though we only have two questions from the floor, could we have could we have our panelists round off this session, please? Are you optimistic or pessimistic about U.S.-China relations? Neither optimistic nor pessimistic. pessimistic. So we should have a very normally. And uh, reasonable expectation for bilateral relations. No illusion for the moment. No, we say some sort of unrealistic, you know, expectation at all. But we still need enthusiasm and even strategic convictions, because U.S.-China U.S. relations absolutely most important and. Most complicated relations in the world. I think you said very well. I think also, um, if China and Xi Jinping really were smart, they would recognize that Biden does want to make a deal. He is the best flight out. Get on board, because you know what's coming after him. We don't know, <laughs> and it might be a lot worse. This is a guy who knows Xi Jinping better than any world leader because they spend more time together. My God, if they can't sit down and say, "Listen, the world is at an at a critical point here. It's in your interest. It's in my interest. It's in the world's interest to settle something." If they can't do that, well, I guess I'm just going to be pessimistic. <laughs> Great, uh, I agree. Mm. Yeah. Uh, a politically correct answer is I'm optimistic, and the honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, it, it really depends on what these two countries do in the future, especially in the next ten years, because history is often made by by accidents, not necessarily by. So by by choice. So it really depends on what happens. Mm? Well, thank you, panelists. I think you have been wonderful, mm. and we surely want to remain mm. hopeful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.